Hello, hello, hello. Hello, everybody. It's Uncle Grumpy. It's a wonderful Friday night in Oklahoma. Hopefully you guys are enjoying yourselves. You're home safely or something like that. I'm going to give you a minute to join in. I see some people joining in already. Hello. Hello, Maddie. Maddie, we're going to talk about your subject again tonight. Julia Zell is going to join me in just a minute. Uh, everybody, welcome to Grumpy Tonight. Let's see. Okay. Um, for those that didn't see last night's show, we've been talking about a number of issues. Last night was uh, some raids that are going da on down in the Lawton area. Um, sheriffs with drug dogs searching the apartment complexes of people who have federally assisted housing. Um, I personally find that appalling. I think it should be a violation of, uh, well, it's a violation of any decency, that's for sure. But uh, we want to bring some attention to this. Just give me a minute here. Okay. We want to bring some attention to this because uh, if we don't, it's just going to keep happening. I mean, the only way we change anything in this world is first by shining a light on it. Now, um, Do Dottie, who's on here now, is that right? Let's see. I think she's on here. Maddie. I'm sorry. Maddie, who's on here now, contacted us a couple days ago about this originally. This is searches going on down uh, in a... Uh, Lawton area. Um, I was contacted today by another one of you guys out there watching. She's probably watching right now, and that's Julie at Red Bud Dispensary. I want to thank uh, Julie and give a shout out to Red Bud Dispensary for her calling to let me know what she found out about this. Because the only way we find out about this is with everybody's help. So I'm going to bring Julie on here. Hopefully she's on here, and we are going to... Julie, I don't see you on here. You need to do whatever you did last night. Um, we're going to talk about the what we're finding out so far. There she is. All right, there she is. Okay. And we're going to bring Julie on. Hopefully the sound will stay. All of you guys let me know if we have any issues with the sound or anything else. We'll see how it goes. Come on. There we go. She's here. Hi, Julie. Hey, how are you? Good. Thank you for joining us. For those that don't know it, this is Ju attorney Julia Zell. She's one of the leading cannabis attorneys in the state right now and a very close personal friend of mine. Uh, I like to brag about that. You're good people. And I like everybody to know it. Um, oh, Julie's thanks. been doing a lot of work uh, to help a lot of people in this industry, not just set up their businesses, but she's been helping cardholders, too. Uh, I, I want to point out again, she missed a show a couple nights ago because she dropped everything to run to the side of a cardholder who had DHS show up at their house. And that's what good people do. So thank you, Julie, for that. Absolutely. So, Happy to help. Julie, uh, why don't you refresh us on what you remember about where we're at as far as this <laughs> current situation? Um, are you talking about the situation with the unlawful raids or with the, the... With, the with the raids on the federally uh, federal housing? Sure. As I was just saying, let me let me tell you, I heard from Julie at Red Bud Dispensary today. And again, a shout out to Red Bud and to Julie for, for contacting me, telling me that it was uh, reaffirming what Matt Eatery told us, that it was Comanche County Sheriff's Department that searched the Sterling apartments. Uh, and now what she also told me was. Um, she spoke to somebody in the property management, and it's the same DA for uh, Stevens County and Grady County, I guess. I have not looked that so, up yet. So that would, yeah, so that would be Jason Hicks, and Jason Hicks um, is very well known to be anti-medical marijuana, and there was a um, conference down there, I want to say in January in Duncan, and Bud Scott was there, Jason Hicks was there, and, you know, a couple other members, and Jason had extreme concerns about 7088, said that it's recreational, not medical. He said that there should be uh, required um, conditions in order for people to get their medical cards. It was just very evident that he is uh, very anti-788, 
in addition, um, he was also against state question 780, the one that we're going to talk about in House Bill 1269, where, you know, it made misdemeanor um, possession charges that used to be felony charges. He also came out against strongly against that one. And so, you know, I hate to say it, but there's really no surprise here that a lot of this is coming out of his jurisdiction. Okay, well, we need to find out more about Jason Hicks. It sounds like you know quite a bit. Um, maybe we need to figure out where his financial uh, interests lie and why it is he, he insists on continuing to rob from the poor and, and give to the government. Um, I, I think it's worth looking into. What do you think? Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. I do know that prior – he went to law school a little bit later in life, and prior to that he was a business owner owned a couple of businesses. I don't recall what they are, but I agree with you. There's, there's definitely something worth looking into there. And just, you know, based upon my knowledge of him as an attorney and who he associates with, he typically associates with very conservative, very anti-criminal justice reform, anti-marijuana type people. And so, you know, this is the kind of district attorney that's out there, you know, directing the sheriff's department. So um, I didn't realize we had uh, DAs that would cover more than one county. Is that yeah, common? There's, oh, yes, it is. There's um, 77 counties in Oklahoma and 27 district attorneys oh. statewide. So, it, it, you know, some of them can be up to five counties, just depending on the, on the population of those counties. And so it's per capita? So, yeah, and I believe he is. I know he's over Grady County, Stevens County. Um, he's not over Lawton, but he's over five i want to say caddo county as well but he's over f five counties down there so he's got a pretty big area that he oversees okay well i think we need to look into his record a bit and see what kind of prosecutions we're seeing down there because this 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 sounds like one of the places we need to go with what we've been talking about with uh, the seminars mm -hmm. to help instruct everybody in what the laws actually are now granted he's a district attorney he's not exactly uh going to have to listen to us, but at least we can meet with their law enforcement, possibly, and some of their citizens, and inform them as to what what's actually legal. I know a mm -hmm. lot of law enforcement are just going on the, um, the whim of the district attorney. I'm finding, uh, from the people that reach out to me, every single county seems to have a different scenario. Everybody has a different look at 788. Everybody has a different look at the $400 fine, uh, whether you have your card or not. Every county has a different look as to whether you're going to get handcuffed if you don't have a card. It really seems to be that, there, that the idea of all men are created equal is completely eliminated from uh, the area of cannabis and law enforcement. What do you think? I would agree with you completely. And, you know, that is actually – an appropriate segue into the other topic that we were going to discuss, which was House Bill 1269, which is the um, bill that will provide for expungements of a lot of felony possession charges. Okay, As you well, let, let, out, me, let, let me set that up. That's the bill that we know just passed uh, recently. What was it, yesterday, I think? or um, Yeah, I very believe recently. it was yesterday. And but, this, is, right. this is the one we talked about last night that will, in a lot of cases, expunge records um, for people who have been convicted of possession only, possession of marijuana with no violent charges, with no uh, intent to distribute charges. And that brought up the larger conversation that I started with you about what's considered intent, because to my knowledge, being the, the one who's been in the handcuffs, intent is how much you have on you and mm -hmm. not what your actual intent is, but it's a weight and that, again, depends on where you're located. What, what have you found out? I know this is a large bill. I know we're going to need lo longer to digest this completely. But can you tell us where you're at with researching it so far? Yeah, and I have to tell you, you know, I have spent probably four or five hours on this bill. And it's really been fascinating because, as you said, if somebody was charged with intent, and, you know, received any kind of, you know, sentencing other than an outright dismissal on that, then they're not eligible for expungement under 1269. And so I wanted to go look and see, you know, how many people are charged with intent to distribute when charged with possession? What is the, you know, 
possession amount that will get them charged with intent. I mean, people can get charged with intent if they are, you know, distributing or dealing, that's easy. But when, when the police have no evidence with that, you're right. A certain, you know, having a certain amount of marijuana or any drug on their person automatically get, can get them an intent charge. And what I've had a hard time with is since 1999, the bill that sets the amounts for intent to distribute and other drugs since 1999, it's been amended 14 times. So this bill has been touched a lot. It obviously hasn't worked well. And the legislature has been in, you know, tweaking it, either making it more stringent or less stringent. But what I found is so far is if you are in the Southern part of Oklahoma or the Eastern part of Oklahoma, there's a much higher chance that you would have been charged with possession if you had the amount set at statute it just overall across the board you're automatically going to get a a, sorry distribution charge if you have you know whatever the amount was in statute whether or not there was any evidence that you were actually distributing or dealing okay hold on you said hold on you said that it was amended multiple times 14 okay. times. And is that the part that sets the weight as to what decides what distribution is? Was it always a weight or has it been something else or is that what's been adjusted? It is since 99, it's been a weight, but that amount and how those charges, the elements of those charges have changed. I mean, the, the statute that sets intent to distribute includes every single type of schedule one drug. And so you're talking about a six or seven page statute and the limits, the elements of the, the various crimes, not just intent is in there, but manufacturing, you know, possession by minors, distribution by minors. And so it takes some work to track the changes from year to year because, you know, what the bill was or what the statute was in 1999 may be completely different when rewritten in 2001. But What I have found based upon my initial research, like I said, if you're in South or Eastern Oklahoma, you're much more likely to be charged with distribution period. However, there are a lot of counties where when I would see the amount, the minimum threshold for intent, let's say, let's just say it was two ounces in whatever year. There was not everybody who was arrested with two ounces of marijuana, which charged with distribution you know i could go and see you know their the statement of facts and their their plea agreements where they you know state out you know what they did and oftentimes most of the time there is no indication on the part of the defendant they that they were distributing and i could not you know two-thirds of the time these people would be charged with distribution another third of the time they wouldn't and they all seem the same to me. And so there was, there's something more at play in these charges. It just seems to be very arbitrary. And so I, you know, as I told you on the phone earlier today, I'd like to spend some more time and look and see if there was something else that, you know, these prosecutors are looking at. Are they, I mean, of course they might be looking at prior records, but prior records don't speak to your intent with a new crime. That, yeah, but Julie, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, Julie, but uh, as I've said, as the person who's been in the handcuffs, um, this is the way it works. I mean, this is, they're looking at, well, in my opinion, they're looking at the color of your skin. They're looking at how much money you have. Gender. They're looking at what kind of car you drive. They're looking at your and gender. You said Men you found much a, more... you, yeah, you said you found a, a, a discrepancy in gender. Explain that. Oh, yeah. Men are at least twice as likely to be charged with distribution as women. As women with are. With the same and quantity. With the same quantity. And, you know, Chris, you know, what you said about this is how it works. I agree with you that that is how it works in procedurally. That's when we look at these cases. That's what they see. We see this is not how it should work under the law. Right. If if these right. cases went to trial, if they were appealed to the Supreme Court, these provisions would be thrown out because they are considering things in these charges that are outside the statute. 
and so I don't mean to sound naive. I'm talking from a pure legal standpoint, if the right things were done, which clearly they haven't always been, you know, they, they like to, as we talked about last night, throw on as many charges as they can just so they can get better leverage against these defendants. And keep in mind, Chris, that the fee, the probation and court fees paid that by these defendants when they're charged by the district attorneys, the district attorney's offices are typically funded 60% by those very fees. And, you know, so, I know from experience that, uh, it, as you say, they pile on the charges, and then when it comes to cutting the deal, they'll, they'll let you settle for a lesser charge, but they'll still fine you for all of those charges. Correct, the, correct. The money, the money will still be attached to every one of them in the long run. Right. They'll still get you for the maximum amount. Right, and if they had, you know, charged you appropriately at the beginning with just possession, then, you know, any good defense lawyer isn't going to just, you know, plead you guilty to possession. You're going to, you know, first-time offense, get a suspended or a deferred sentence. You might get a complete dismissal if you complete your probation. But when they tack on these additional charges, well, then you've got two charges to negotiate on, and your position is weakened. And, you know, keep in mind that I'm only talking about people who can hire lawyers. There's a lot of people in these situations who used to who have to use public defenders. And I am by no means saying that public defenders are not great lawyers. They are, but they are overworked and they do yeah. not have the time to devote to these cases that a private lawyer would. And so oftentimes, you know, these people get all of these tacked on charges and they do not have the ability to fight them and handle them like somebody more affluent would who could hire an attorney. And, you know, as I told you, we see, we see more African Americans, we see more men, we see more poor people charged with these, with possession and drug charges time and time again. Well, uh, I want to state, I know there's a, there's a lot of organizations out there that study this. And I think we're going to have to start looking at their numbers. Um, I, I don't mean, I, I hope by bringing this up now, we don't sound shocked like we think this sort of thing just started no, or, it no. just, or it just started mattering to us. It's just tied into cannabis uh, right. in this particular issue because um, this particular person, is uh, this district attorney with us doing the searches is so strong against cannabis. We know all this is, is cannabis related. So uh, that's why we're bringing it up here. And I, I think we're going to have to look farther into this. I know you're going to need some further time to, to study that bill. Go ahead. You're trying to say something. Well, and, you know, I was going to say our point in discussing all of this is that this bill is a good first step, but we need to be real and honest about what it does and what it doesn't do. And it doesn't afford a lot of people similarly situated the same expungement as the person who essentially did the same thing they did just because they got some hard ass. Oh, sorry just because they got some strong district attorney that thought that he was going to tack on some charges. And th that's not fair. That's not appropriate. That's not how sh this should happen. And we just want people to be educated as, yeah, it's a good bill. It could be better. Okay. Yeah. And another thing I want to do, I want to bring up the searches again. Um, as Julie from Red Bud Dispensary said, <clears throat> this district attorney, um, She's found out they're going to be doing more searches on Monday in Marlowe and Rush, which I think she's, she said was Grady County, um, but she wasn't positive about that. But that's where they told her they were searching. This would be the – this. what I'm curious about, though, is if this is federal housing and they're using the local sheriff, how is the district attorney involved? Well, the, the district attorney provides legal advice and guidance to the sheriff, tells him if he can lawfully do something or not. And so as the sheriff, he, you know, we know that there's federal actors involved on these searches. And so the sheriff would likely go to the DA and say, hey, you know, marijuana is, you know, legal statewide, but, you know, the federal, the feds are wanting to do these drug searches. I agree that, you know, the impetus, part of the impetus might be more than marijuana, but, you know, he, the sheriff is essentially saying to the DA, is it okay for us to go? Can we use state resources? And so, you know, the DA had to have signed off on that or very likely the sheriff wouldn't be out there. So this district attorney is allowing the, the, the sheriff of this county to use state funds 
to search houses with drug dogs and possibly uh, prosecute people who have cannabis, whether or not they have a medical marijuana card or not. Not relevant in this case is what I'm being told. Right, but correct. However, those charges for marijuana could only be could not be state charges. Because again, there's no, I mean, I guess it could be state misdemeanor charges, but the, th the thought that we would be spending that much time just to get misdemeanor possession is shocking. And it would, I, you know, there were some comments last night that some of the gentlemen watching thought, you know, they really must be looking for another drug here. I can't imagine they just go in for marijuana. Let's hope that's the case, because if they are just looking for marijuana, then there there certainly is a violation of the law, you know, using the police power inappropriately, because if they're just targeting marijuana, you know, and that is, yes, it is, it's legal under state law. If you have a patient card, it is a misdemeanor. Um, for the most part, if you don't, but we don't go out and do, you know, deploy typically this kind of police power and the amount of time and people involved just to charge people with, you know, $400 possession. So what, what I'm curious about really here is, is, um, is it legal? And, and I know you're gonna have to see some of these leases, but I'm curious in the big picture, is it legal to do drug sweeps like the, to do sweeps? Again, they're doing searches without probable cause. They're just saying, well, you live in federal housing, we get to come check. So long as there is a consent clause in their lease, 90% of the time they are legal, provided that there is some basis for the search and my guess is you know somebody within the last <clears throat> six months at one of the at each of these complexes had some type of drug charge and the the you know the the amount necessary for probable cause is low but you know i talked about how these started in chicago in the 80s chicago in the 80s the you know the basis was that they knew <clears throat> that some of the residents living there had had drug charges it was legal to have drugs in those complexes, and that's why they started the sweeps. And so if anybody in those complexes, even one person, has a drug charge, that's that's really all it takes. Unfortunately, because these leases have these stupid consent clauses. So to get federal housing assistance, you must be willing to sign over your right to privacy and be willing to submit to a drug dog search of everything you own at any moment. Yes. And, and believe me, you, that when I researched and read the case law on this, I was absolutely shocked. The court in the 80s spun it like that there was some great public policy here served by making residents safe on drugs. And you got to remember, this started in the 80s. This was, you know, Reagan's war on drugs. <clears throat> it was a different time and a different mindset. I don't know that that would hold up with today's Supreme Court. Yeah, but it did but... in the 80s, and it hasn't been that that hasn't been tested again. Right. And whether it would hold up in the Supreme Court or now doesn't matter because the fact is they're, they're kicking the doors in, you know, they're, well, they're not kicking them. Right. In, it's already happened. The harm has already happened. Right. Yeah. Right. They're already doing the searches. Uh, look, here's what I want to do. And I want to wrap this up fairly quick. You're having a, a bit of a uh, stall there anyway. Hopefully uh, those of you watching, if you do get a stall from uh, either end, usually if you go back and watch it the second time, if it played all the way through, when it when you replays and it's not live, it will usually eliminate those stalls. So if you if there's anything there you missed, go back and watch it again. I bet it'll play oh, out clear. That that's just a stall. I thought that was your face. <laughs> Happy okay. <Friday> night. <laughs> okay. All right. It has to be one every night, doesn't there? Aren't you going to tell me to cut the beard? No, I think the face was good enough. <laughs> okay. All right. So well, look, here's what I think we need to do. Um, we need to know more about this DA. Um, if anybody sure. in that area knows about this DA, we need to know more about this DA. Um, I mean, I don't care about his personal life. I don't want him to know about his wife and kids. I want to know about his financial holdings, though. I want to know why he's so uh, animate about this or, you know, what is it in him that makes him not see the light when it comes to cannabis? Uh, what makes it okay? And, and on a bigger note, what makes it okay for anybody anywhere to be doing searches like this um, I think that's appalling I understand it may be legal it doesn't make it right 
Okay? Absolutely. Not Absolutely. Legal, legal and right rarely fall in the same category. Agreed, rarely. especially and in it, this and state. In, and in this case, they are so far apart. They are so far mm -hmm. apart. And then as Julie, as Julie from Redbud said, they're going to do this in Marlowe and Rush on Monday. I don't know how many of you are, are busy on Monday. Um, I'm supposed to be at the Capitol Monday morning, but I'm thinking maybe we might have to see if we can get a squad of people down there with cameras to these different apartment complexes well, and I'm, just to stand I'm, and, re and watch. And I'm going to spend some time this weekend identifying which complexes in both cities are federally funded housing so that we'll have an idea where to go on Monday, if nothing else. Marla is not a huge town. There's not going to be a lot of places, so it, it won't be hard. Right. Okay, folks, we are going to need your help for this. We're going to need a, a small army. You know, if we could send a few people, I don't want anybody going to these places alone. Um, you know, we're dealing with law enforcement. They see you taking video. They may decide they want that video, and that may not be good. So don't go to any of these things alone. Let's team up in small groups and uh, see if we can maybe monitor some of this. Um, I, I can't be the only, we can't be the only two out here who find this appalling. I hope not. I, ho I really hope not. So it looks like we may be making a trip to Marlowe on Monday. I know I'll be going back to the city as always on Sunday and we will do a, a show on Sunday. Maybe we can uh, delve into this a little a little farther. Absolutely. Only we'll, only we'll be in the same room, so we won't have any connection issues. Okay, Julie. Well, you want to wrap anything up before we go, or? No, I'm I'm good. I just, you know, you and I were talking on the phone earlier about looking forward to Green Retreat and how that's been opened up to the entire family and kids, and that's going to be a great event just a little over a month away. So, yeah. My oh, here look. is a. Here's a big one. I don't mean to interrupt you. Here's a big one I want to ask you about. It's about a charity. Aren't you part of a charity? Don't you? Um, you have a you have a son with special needs, right? I do. Yes, and, I do. And don't, and don't you work with the charity that that helps with that? I, Autism Edmond in Autism Oklahoma. Yes, I okay. um, led. Yes, okay. absolutely. Very much. I, I've said I want everybody to join me for this poker ride on the 23rd of June from. Uh, from the Blue Whale to uh, the, to the state capitol. On Old Route 66, a poker ride is where you make five stops along the way. You draw a card at each place. Best hand gets a, a big prize. Worst hand gets another prize. And a few other hands get prizes too. The way, that, the way these things work, they're always for charity. Half the money goes to the charity. Half the money goes to the purses. Nice. This is not something right. where the event's going to make any money. Julie, I would like to – I would like to – uh, get you involved in this, and I would like your charity to be the one oh, that yes. gets uh, yes. the, the money from that event. That would be that wonderful. Thank you. That sounds awesome. Great. Thank you. Yes. Great. Okay, folks, so there you go. We're going to raise some money for – what's the name of the charity again? Autism Oklahoma for kids with autism all over the state. Okay, well, there you go, guys. doesn't get any better than that. So join me on the 23rd from the Blue Whale in Coweta, to uh, the state capitol down old route 66 should be a lot of fun bring your motorcycle if you don't have a motorcycle bring your car bring your truck bring your train i don't care get a plane and fly overhead and take video whatever you got come with us uh, we will have a small entry fee as we just said to raise money for charity usually these things run about twenty dollars a head to join i think that's a a little high um, i'm going to talk to some people who help me organize this See if we can do it for about half that, um, but we'll we'll know that we'll know more of that for sure by Monday. This will all be set in stone by Monday. Uh, I've already got a reach out by one uh, business along the way on Route 66, uh, a diner. Let's see if I can find it here in my notes. Uh, Daniel from Fat Daddy Cafe in Wellston called. He would love nice. to, to have us all show up and i'm thinking just outside oklahoma city i'm going to be pretty hungry about that mm -hmm. so i think maybe that might be a good place to start so if there's any other businesses out there reach out to us i'd like you to to get a booth at the at the event uh the green retreat so we can tie it into that too but this is about raising money for charity this is not about uh tying you into an event so reach out let's get this done 
let's raise some money for autism, uh, kids with autism here in Oklahoma. So, okay, Julie, I'm going to let Chris. you go. I want to thank you okay. for coming on tonight and for all that you do for us. I appreciate it. I couldn't do it without you. Yeah, I will, yeah, I will good. talk to you tomorrow. Okay, sounds good. All right, have a good night. Thank you, Julie. You too. Uh -huh. Bye-bye. Okay, folks, thank you to Julia Zell for coming on and helping us with all that, explaining some of that to us. I see a lot of you have dropped out. Uh, those of you that have in 29th in Oklahoma City at Lost Lake, it's going to be a good time. Um, I, I mean, just look on the end, look it up. There's so much going on, I can't run down the list. So, and it's getting bigger every day. Uh, it's going to be a really exciting event. And as we just discussed, I want to do a charity ride from the Blue Whale to the state capitol the Sunday before that. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to all those that are having events on the 26th. I know that's during the week, uh, but that is the anniversary, and I intend to make it to as many of those as possible. If you're having an event that day, throw a shout out to me, and uh, if you want me to stop by, I'd love to stop by, bring some attention to everything going on in Oklahoma. Um, it's, it's a green wave, it's here. It's getting better every day. We have problems like this DA, but that used to be the norm. Now it's um, rare enough that we notice it and we draw attention to it and we reach out and we try and address it. So that's a good thing. We're making progress. Every day we're making progress. You know, this is the Cannabis Constitution here. If you guys haven't read this, uh, look online. It's on there. Just type in Cannabis Constitution of Oklahoma. You'll find the Facebook page. Um, you know, it, it gives you a lot of ideas of what we, what we would consider the perfect cannabis world here in Oklahoma, uh, what we would like to see happen, what was supposed to happen with 788, and where, where our heart lies. Uh, I can tell you we're working on some amendments for it. Any good constitution has some amendments. Everything changes with time. So uh, we're hoping to maybe have those amendments rolled out by the time the green retreat comes. So... If you're there, you can get first look at the new amendments and uh, have some input. So, okay, folks, that's it for now. Um, I think tomorrow, I don't know that I'm going to do a video tomorrow night because I will probably be wrapping everything up here at home, um, getting ready to head back to the city Monday or Sunday. As always, Sunday's a super busy day for me. I got meetings Sunday morning, the show uh, Sunday afternoon, and, and then usually some more stuff Sunday night followed by Monday at the Capitol. But this Monday may be with the camera outside of federal assisted housing, waiting to see how much of our state tax dollars is going to prosecute people for Oklahoma, a place where we've already passed legal medical marijuana. All right, folks, that's it for now. Until later, stay grumpy. I'll see you on the road.